in the Department of Large Animal Clinical Sciences. And uh, she, her major um, professor in her PhD program is Dr. Owen Ray. Uh, and she is going to present an update to us today on her research looking at um, the reasons for neonatal weak calf syndrome. So thanks very much, Miriam. Hi, everyone. I hope everybody can hear me fine. Yes. Okay. So we're going to start. And first, we're going to, uh, I'm going to explain what neonatal weakness is, uh, what's the history, repercussions, and what breeds it happens, a little bit about Japanese black cattle. And then I'm going to focus on why we are, uh, why we're uh, interested in this in Brahma what studies have been done and what's happening with them. Then the different etiology suggested for uh, neonatal weakness in Brahma. Then we're gonna see the knowledge gaps, our hypothesis, objectives, descriptive data on where we are and results on pure Brahma. And then what is next, where are we working on next? So what is neonatal weak calf syndrome? It was first described in Montana in 1964, uh, a big chunk of their uh, calf crop just got deceased apparently and they didn't know what was going on they just noticed that the calves were weak they couldn't nurse they weren't doing well and these caused the death toll from go to from four percent up to 32 36 percent which is very considerable these calves were also very prone to diarrhea and infections and they had a very high mortality so one of the things that they did is they did, uh, they did uh, blood transfusions on some of those calves. And they had all these things where it had the blood had to come from a dam that had had a calf with neonatal weakness within the past couple months. And that's how they saved a few of the animals. But nobody could specify what the clinical signs or lesions were. So depression was the biggest one in this animal. And the majority were reluctant to stand, but it wasn't on all of them. They have, there was a failure of nursing, a crusty muscle, and diarrhea. So they came with these um, calving bigger score description, kind of, sort of, which the ones that we focused on, this is still used, unfortunately, is the, a calf number one is a normal calf, a calf number two is a weak calf, but that can nurse by itself, and a calf number three is a weak calf, but needs major care and efforts and help nursing. Then there's other two that I'm not going to put here because they're very confusing. And number four is a calf that died before three days. And a number five is a calf that died after three days. So this tells you nothing about weakness or ability to nurse or stand or anything. So that's why we're focusing on a Kevin bigger score one to three on what we have. Um, a crusty muscle was very common too, and diarrhea. So the earlier literature indicated that from six to 15% of the calves were gonna be affected by 10 days of age. So these had a major surge of studies between the 1970s and 1990s. And our biggest repercussion here is obviously because of the money. You're losing the, the steers or the heifers, which is a lot of money. You're also spending a lot of time and effort, veterinary bills. And if you have a calf that it's not doing well, well, they're more likely to be taken down by predators. So all of these is affecting. And that is also not counting that you're probably going to lose a dam because if she's not bringing a calf up to weaning, she's probably going to be let go from the herd. Then in what breeds does this happen? It has been shown in a wide variety of breeds. Most prone in the Japanese black cattle that we all know as Wagyu. Then in the Brahma, the Holstein, Jersey, Angus. Scottish cattle, brown, uh, Swiss limousine, Hereford, and Kianina. So if you see here, the only post indicus breed that uh, is, has a lot of these is Brahma. It's mostly in Bostaros breeds. And now talking about Japanese black cattle, these guys are very expensive. So that's why they were uh, trying to figure out what was going on. Because at birth, these animals had a very low birth weight. They were under 20 kilograms. They were anemic, had depression, weakness. Um, their body temperature was variable when compared to the normal ones. 
they dehydrated fairly easily, they were ecstatic. And when they did uh, necropsies to try to figure out what was going on uh, anatomically, they found that a lot of these guys didn't have a thymus, it was hypoplastic, or if they had it, it had no hassle bodies. There was also no, no clear distinction on the ger germinal centers of the spleen and the red bone marrow was atrophied. So it's very heavy affecting their immune system. So these calves are obviously highly susceptible to infection and most of them die um, fairly close after birth. So at first they thought it was probably a congenital immune insufficiency, right? It's probably it's affecting the CD8 cells and the um, gamma delta T cells. So that's why they're getting sick. But then they noticed that there was a D effect of these bull M that was heightened if they, he was combined with dams from a certain family. So they started thinking, well, maybe there's something uh, more than just um, immune deficiency here, but it's maybe uh, genetically driven. So they saw that the incidence was uh, influenced by both sires and dams. And afterwards, they finally figure out that it was one gene, the IARS gene, that came from a common bull ancestor. So they eliminated the animals that came from this bull, and that's how they eliminated the problem in this breed. Now, for Brella, the story is a little bit different. First, why do we care about them? They rank ninth overall in the cattle breeds world, worldwide. They're present in 45 countries, but they're a major component of the cattle here in Florida, Louisiana, and Texas. And that's why, because um, they are very resistant to parasites, they're very resistant to heat and humidity. So they do very well in these uh, weathers. But if you have a problem in a, in a big breed that's also giving you uh, crosses, then you have something that you have to look into. So there's really no, uh, no phenotype formed over the years to identify the affected calves, and that's one of our major problems. Um, you can see that in some of the studies, and I'm gonna show you the studies in a little bit, uh, the birth weight is lowered, and sometimes there is low on inexistence, so on reflex, depending on how they're scoring the, the weakness, you might find it or not, but a suckling reflex is very important. Uh, the higher the calving bigger score, they're uh, weaker, they have more astasia and ataxia, so they're wobbly, can, uh, um, no, they just cannot stand properly and walk properly. They dehydrate very fast and they're very susceptible to infection early on, and they just remain poor doers. And the weird thing with the Brahma, as opposed to the Japanese bat cattle, is that if you pour your resources into these animals, uh, you can actually pretty much save them, but this also brings a lot of time, a lot of effort that you shouldn't have to be setting on these animals. So for the studies in the USA, there was a huge study in Texas that used almost 10,000 calves, and this study found that if we use that uh, having bigger score or calf bigger score, they only found 7% lack bigger, but if you uh, so into the suck, suckling reflex score, that 27, almost 30% of the calves needed help nursing. And they actually found that the nursing instinct had to do with the sire of the calf and the year of birth. So that was telling us a little bit like, oh, there's probably genetic components here and maybe there's some uh, weather components that we should be looking at. So then Dr. Frank here at the University of Florida he did a study in 1971 and 72, and he found that about 20% of the, of the calf crop, pure Brahma calf crop, was born with neonatal weakness. They checked on blood, and they found uh, high corticosteroids. That is here. And they also found that they, they had less um, birth weight and that they, their temperature, instead of uh, stabilizing, it just went down over the first uh, 12 hours by almost two degrees Celsius. So then Kim and colleagues in Louisiana did another study and then they tried to elucidate what was going on with the, in, with the dummy calf syndrome through the behavior of the dam. 
And in this one, the difference is they use crossbred Brahma and pure Brahma animals. So they found that the animals appeared normal, they were alert, they were able to, able to swallow, but they lacked the ability or instinct to suckle, and they could be of any bird. So this is what came out of Kim's um, study, and you, the first three points out of his dummy calf checklist are pertaining to calf bigger, and the rest of them are pertaining to the animal's ability to suckle. So here's where we have a big problem because most of the data sets that you're going to find are going to have those uh, one to five calf bigger scores, but they're not going to recur nursing or, so or suckling uh, reflex, which is very important if we want to talk about weakness. So that's one of the downsides of um, working with data sets that have been collected. So we need to go forward adding this. And then the studies in Australia, it showed that there was a high mortality for calves that uh, had neonatal weakness. It occurs on calves of any bird weight, size, and sex. Uh, so this is, uh, looks like what Kim was showing. The calves get exhausted very easily. So these animals are weak and they just cannot do it by themselves. But when you compare them to other breeds, the pure Brahma cattle have a higher percentage of neonatal weakness. So there was a study from row one and he found that 9.8% of, of the calves were affected of, at birth. But if you saw pure Hereford, it was only 0.2% versus Hereford by Brahma, it went up to 0.7%. And then he saw that 17.6% of the prenatal de deaths, out of that, 40, almost 50% were due to neonatal weakness. And then he found that they, he had two associated bulls. So those bulls, gave you um, almost 50% of what was uh, inherently genetic out of these. And then Holroyd compared the Sahiwal versus the Brahma. A Sahiwal are these guys who are uh, pure boss indicus, and they had 0% neonatal weakness versus Brahma that had 46 to 8.7% in his study. Then we have Dr. Landaeta, who did uh, several studies in Venezuela, and Dr. Plasse too. So they found uh, that about 20%, 24% of the calf losses are due to neonatal weakness in Brahma ca calves in Venezuela. Then another study found that depending on the farm, you could have 2.5 to 15.3% of, of, of the calf population affected. So these uh, suggested more also genetics because you're usually in Brahma, you use less um, AI. So you're usually using uh, your, your sires in one farm and you're not sharing them around. Then there was a study that found that about 30% of the crop was affected at birth. And Dr. Landaeta found significant effects of the sire of the calf and the sire of the dam. Then he thought it was probably a genetic component of um, a homozygous recessive factor of incomplete penetration. And that's why he was seeing so much variation in what was happening in the calves. But he noticed that there was a higher incidence in red Brahma than in gray Brahma. Now here in the US, we have more gray Brahma than red Brahma. So that is uh, one of our biggest differences with uh, Venezuela. If you look at the Brahmas here in Florida, you're going to find around 10 to 14 percent of the calf crop affected versus what they were seeing there with the red Brahma, which was 25 to, to over 30 percent. Dr. Landaeta and his studies found three bulls associated and a tendency of lower birth weight, but uh, a difference of nine kilograms at weaning weight. So with all of these, what was the etiology suggested and followed? First, it was thermoregulation because the Brahmas inherently don't do well in the cold. So they were thinking, well, if it's colder, they're showing these more, or if it's colder, it's causing it. And one of the things that Dr. Landaeta told me is uh, in Venezuela, we don't have problems with being cold and we still see quite a bit of this. So how can we explain that? So I was like, well, yeah, maybe it's related, but it's not, it's, it might be a risk factor, but not uh, per se what is causing the thing. 
So then we thought, uh, it has been thought about dystocia, right? Dystocia causes hypoxia and hypoxia causes a very similar phenotype to neonatal weakness. But then once you start looking at the research, dystocia is very reduced in, Bra in bus indicus, especially in Brahma, because they have smaller birth weights. So I found one study that said, oh, uh, it was probably because of parturient anoxia, and it's, this is what causes the weak Brahma caps. But then they did a study with only eutosic births, no dystocias, and they still found that uh, neonatal weakness was a problem within the Brahma breed. Then nutrition was uh, suggested. Okay, animals that the dams lack protein during gestation or are, are deficient in selenium give you very similar phenotypes too. So what they did then is they had different groups giving different uh, amounts of protein and then animals that were given selenium and they found that you still had neonatal weakness in the cattle. So if it's not all of these, well, everything has been pointing at genetics, right? So we're gonna explore that now. Our biggest knowledge gaps was that we don't know the weather and the maternal environment effects. They have been suggested, it has been shown that it happens um, like colder weather affects them more, but we didn't know exactly what was going on. And we needed to explore the possible genetic factors and then the anatomical differences for Brahma, both in gross anatomical and histological. Now for this presentation, you will not have the anatomical differences because they're still uh, being looked at by Dr. Abbott. So this is gonna be on my final defense. So don't expect to see anatomical differences here, please. So what is our hypoth hypothesis? It is that neonatal weakness is a complex condition with multiple small gene effects associated to environmental and mater maternal risk factors with gross anatomical and or histological differences from normal calves. Our objectives are to define these risk, risk factors associated with neonatal weak calf syndrome, look for sire and sire of the dam effects through heritability, look for weather associations and better defined neonatal weakness in the Brahma breed. So this is our first um, data set. This is only pure Brahma. It was from UF and Brooksville. It spanned from 1955 to 2018. We ended up with 3,642 pure Brahma calves. We only had two seasons, winter and spring, because Florida. And our exclusion criteria was we didn't add any stillborn um, ET calves, twins, or animals from dystocia. We wanted to get rid of that noise and put it on the side so we could look at the normal, normal animals and see what was going on between them. So with that, we defined that we had um, 437 calves affected by neonatal weak calf syndrome and 3,205 animals deemed as unaffected or normal. We divide them in bulls and heifers. So we have a similar number of bulls here, 1820 and 1822 for heifers, but we have a difference in percentages. So the bulls have 13, almost 14%, the bulk of the, of the uh, neonatal weakness and heifers had only 10.43%. So we were seeing on the raw descriptive data that there was a little bit different there and we're gonna explore it. Then we looked at the deaths of the calves. Um, normal calves, 190 died, which was only 5.9% of the total. And neonatal weak calves, 172 died, which was almost 40%. Now this is only animals that were born alive and died soon after birth or until weaning. So we had several variables, the number of the calf, the birth date, sex, the dam, the sire, the dam age in years, the insemination type. Oh, I uh, forgot to mention, we only used animals that came from natural and AI services, nothing else. The birth type, the calving ease, calving, uh, calf bigger score, birth weight, weaning weight, age at weaning, survival to weaning, and survival codes. 
And then we added the, uh, the temperature, minimal and maximum temperature on the day of birth, average temperature and precipitation. Unfortunately, there was not enough information to add a suckling reflex score, though that did, the animals that had it, it helped us to see if the weakness score uh, was right or not, or, or if it had to be uh, fixed. Then these are just the damn age groups. If we were thinking that maybe neonatal weakness is a problem that happens more in heifers than or in older calves, cows, we, um, this is our raw data showing us that it happens pretty much in all ages. And um, once I show you the statistical model, I'm gonna explain how we explored this. So this is our statistical model. Our calving bigger score groups were the normal or neonatal weakness. Then we have HYS, which is a combination of a herd year and season uh, to get the effect of the, of the farm. Then the sire, the sex of the calf, the birth weight in kilograms, and then birth weight quadratic. We use the dam age in uh, groups. The minimal temperature, linear and quadratic, and same for average temperature and for precipitation. So this is uh, pretty much what the Glimix ran on. And these are our results. So we found that there was an effect of sire, but not an effect of the herd year season. We did find that there was an effect of them age, sex, birth weight, both linear and quadratic, and minimum temperature on the day of birth both linear and quadratic. Then we looked at the sex, the birth weight, the temperature and the dam age to get our odds ratio. And here the sex were, were um, male versus female. The, the risk was higher for males. But when you look at birth weight from the mean, the things change. So as the animals start getting uh, are born a little bit heavier, the risk lowers. And it's the same for temperature. As the animals are born in uh, one degree Celsius higher, the, the risk lowers. But for them age, it was interesting that only the five and six uh, year old group dams had a protective effect versus the, the rest of the dams had no difference with the olders, oldest dams, which were the 12 year old. So this is the birth weight. This is how, uh, how it looks, our, our graph with each calf and the probability. So this is the, the line that the probability follows. Our odds ratio, if you remember, was protective. It was 0.9. And our um, interval was 0.88 to 0.92. So this means that for calves that are born, one kilogram more than the mean of 31.52 kilograms, the risk would be lowered by 11%. Now for the minimum temperature on the day of birth, the effect was not as pronounced as the birth weight, but we still have the nice effect here. So again, a protective uh, odds ratio. And this odds ratio says that by one degree Celsius increase from the 9.57 degrees Celsius, the risk by, of presenting neonatal weakness by the calves diminished by 4%. And then the dam age groups. If you remember, we only had the five and the six uh, year olds having a, a protective effect. So for the five year olds compared to the 12 year olds, it was um, 105% uh, protective effect. And for the 6 to 12, it was 72.10. So the risk is reduced by that much. And now the sires. This was very interesting. We had 228 total sires. And of that, uh, we reduced it to all the sires that only had 10 plus offspring. And we ended up with 122. And of those 122, 94 sires were spanning from 2.13 uh, to almost 70% neonatal weakness in their offspring. So here on the side, you can see the sires, the uh, sire number, then the frequency of normal calves, the frequency of uh, 
or the percentage of the on-site progeny of normals than the frequency of neonatal weakness and the percentage of the on sires progeny. And this is the same just graphed. So each little line down here, it's a sire. Each bar is a sire. And the part that doesn't have bars, it's because those were the 28 sires with 0% neonatal weakness within their animals. So you can see that there's a huge variation among sires in the percent of their calves uh, deemed neonatal weakness. So that's one more step for us to say, yes, there is something, um, there's a genetic component in Brahma for neonatal weakness. And then we explored the maternal grandsires, like I was telling you. We had a 220 total out of 100, of those, 107 had more than 10 grand offspring. And of those, 80 had from 2.9 to almost 60% neonatal weakness. So here's the, the farthest uh, on the right line is what should you should be looking at the sire, and this is their grand offspring percentage. And this is the same um, just graph. So going from zero to almost 60%, we had 27 sires that did not have neonatal weakness within their grand sire um, offspring. So I know what you're thinking. It's probably a congenital problem. Well, let me tell you. Uh, the heritability was moderate. It had a 0.276 with a, a good wide span. And this is very good because it means that for this population, we are showing that there is a, a genetic component to neonatal weakness. But then we looked at the inbreeding and the normal calves had a higher percentage of inbreeding that the neonatal weakness calves, and that percentage of inbreeding for both was very, very low. So for example, we have here the um, just the four highest sires, and the, the highest sire, his normal calves, had a higher percentage of inbreeding that the neonatal weakness. And then for the next three sires, there is no inbreeding within their animals. So this was her pricing because we were expecting to see something of a congenital nature. It has been said several times that inbreeding probably has an effect of neonatal weakness, but here we showed that that is not the case. So this is actually good because it means that it's not a problem of recessive genes, but more likely a problem of numerous genes, not of a recessive nature. So what is next? What are we gonna do? I'm gonna show you a little bit of uh, preliminary and ongoing data. So what happens when the animals are crossed? I've talked a lot about pure Brahmas and what is happening with them. So I um, we devised uh, kind of like the same study, but using crossbred animals, Angus by Brahma crosses, which is the biggest number of animals that we have. So that's why we used Angus. Uh, we ended up with a spreadsheet of 2,539 total calves. That's France from 1974 to 2018. And uh, the calves go from 3% Brahma to 97% Brahma. So we wanted a, a wide array of what was going on. So if you look down here, the normal calves are the majority, 97.99%, and the neonatal weakness calves go down to 2.01%. So here we're already seeing that huge different difference going from 12% in the pure Brahma to only 2% in the crossbred animals. And now when we divide them by sex, again, the male, oh, sorry, there we go. The, the male animals have the high majority of uh, neonatal weakness when compared to the females. And the numbers of both male and females are comparable. So dams, uh, just following the same protocol we did, what was going on with the dams. Again, all the ages had um, 
cows with neonatal weakness, but it wasn't a, as big of an issue as it was with the pure grandma. And now the interesting thing, the sires, Oh, well, I think everything is interesting because it's my project. But um, of total sires, we had 216. And out of those, we eliminated everything that had less than 10 offspring, and we kept 93. Out of those 93, 29 had uh, neonatal weak calf syndrome in their offspring. And it went from 0.57 to 16.67%. So here you're seeing the huge difference between pure sires versus uh, what was happening when you were crossing animals. And this is the graph for the crosses. Out of all the 93 sires, 64 had 0% offspring with neonatal weakness versus these um, 29 guys. And uh, so I'm still working on the crosses. That's why that's that's the uh, where I'm at so far. But um, I just wanted to share. Uh, last time I presented, Dr. Thatcher was uh, saying, "Why don't we compare these or that genetics?" And we started brainstorming it and uh, whatnot. So these um, Florida cattle man. Um, offers grants for doing research. And Dr. Hansen was like, hey, why don't we give it a shot? So we just got a genomics grant to compare those pure Brahma sires that go from zero to 69.5%, almost 70% uh, of variation. Sorry, I was trying just to show here. These, these sires, the highest ones up to the lowest ones. So right now we're in the process of collecting semen, uh, blood samples. There's some animals that have been genotyped already. So it's been um, a process that we just started rolling on probably two weeks ago. So it's still on, on, on the move. And in case we, we have trouble finding the majority of the sires, we also have some calves and dams that we can get samples from and uh, several that have been genotyped. So we are trying to get these um, going for, uh, for the project. And then our ultimate aim with all of these is to aid the Brahma breed as it was done with the Japanese black cattle in eliminating or at least diminishing neonatal weekend syndrome on the Brahma crops. And then they're gonna be uh, healthier and it's gonna diminish the economical burden that this is causing. So with this, I will take any questions. Kyle's iPhone raised a hand. Hi, Miriam. Uh, thank you. Very good presentation. I'm um, sorry for the noise. I'm walking towards my, my next class. Uh, I have two questions. One, the first question is, we have been hearing a lot about like the effects of placental development and uh, the effect that it has on the baby's development, right? So it has been a talk that happens frequently in the uh, repro seminar that happens every Wednesday. Is there any study that has evaluated the effect of placental development and if not, do you think there's an effect at all? So there is no, no uh, research that has um, evaluated that. That's one of the questions that we have and uh, one of the things that we wanted to do. Um, but also you have cows that give you, um, I, I have also a graph for the cows that give you calves with neonatal weakness, and then they, then they don't. So if it was a problem with the placenta, like for example, uh, Corian Allen toys, where the placentomes are affected. So you're gonna have uh, a consistency of these uh, happening with the cow. I think if this was something that was placental per se, you would see it 
uh, on if if it happens to the cow, then you would see it on the next and the next and the next and the next. Like it would never go away. Am I making? Does that answer your question? But it would be it would be really nice to be able to get the placentas and compare them histologically. Yeah, that would be interesting to see. Of course, most of the the, the, the projects with placenta are like mouse models or or even uh, humans, I think. But the cows things that get a little bit different to do, uh, hard to do. But uh, it would be interesting to see. And then the, the second thing is you showed your sire data, and there's a huge variation on weak calf syndrome. And I think part of it might be because you have a huge variation on the number of uh, the mates per sire what do you think do you think that splicing your data of sires per quartile would help you evaluate that hmm, i hadn't thought about that that might be interesting yeah i can i can run it and see if if there's something there Yeah, for personal experience, I when I work with data that has this huge variation, quartile helps. So maybe just an idea for you for for your project. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Caio. Oh, sorry. There's questions in the chat that I wasn't making. Um so Jessica. Hi, Miriam. Is there an effect of weak calf syndrome on body weight gain over the lifetime of the surviving calves? Yes. So I only have the, I only run this with the UF um, calves, but yeah, there's almost 20 kilograms difference at weaning. So weak, neonatal weakness also makes you lose money in the, at weaning because we sell them by weight, right? Uh, Beatrice says, great presentation. Sorry, I don't have a microphone. You mentioned that Japanese black cattle calves had anatomical differences. Example, no thymus. What do you expect for the Brahma breed? Anything similar? Yes, I would expect something similar, although not as pronounced as the Japanese black cattle because again, it was one gene. So here we have also a huge variation of what is going on in our phenotype. Some calves need a little bit of help. Some calves need the whole nine yards and you need to go out there and do all the things and, and they still die. So I would expect those calves that still die to have a, a higher uh, affectation on their thymus, on their bone marrow, their spleen, than the calves that only need a little bit of help. And a lot of these calves get, uh, get sick fairly easily, fairly fast after uh, being born. So that is also telling me there's something wrong with their immune system. Miriam, uh, Rina's presentation. Uh, I have a question. Yes, sir. So it's regarding to the, the, the dust differences and the, the, these animals that they are born with uh, these anatomical differences like uh, in the thymus. But when, whenever uh, uh, these animals, they die or they have uh, the, they are weak in the first days uh, after birth, correct? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't they be protected? Uh, if, if the problem was just uh, the immune cells, wouldn't they be protected by, by the colostrum IG, uh, immunoglobulins at, at, at that time? Oh, so that's very nice that you ask about. There was a study done by Omarowski and colleagues in Canada, and they saw that the animals that had a lower suckling reflex, they did not absorb colostrum properly as compared to um, cows that had a strong suckling reflex. So if you have these brown animals having trouble, these are not like uh, your Holsteins that you're there to give colostrum and do all these things. You know, these are born and you go there to check everything is right, tag, and let, wait and let's, let's, let's go. So in this case, it's a little bit more um, complicated because you're not there for them as they drop to pass a tube if they cannot suckle. Brahmas are lower to stand up. The study in Kim actually showed that they, it take the effect of the dummy calves, it take them more than four hours to stand up. So if we have these animals that take more than four hours to stand up, 
are affected in their cycling, they're just not getting to that colostrum in time, which means that there might be a problem in the absorption. We don't know that, but it has been shown that the poor cycling does lead to uh, problems in colostrum absorption. Okay, thank you. Hi, hey, Miriam, uh, I have a question. You mentioned uh, you use uh, bulls for insemination. Do you saw a, a relationship between the days of pregnancy? Between them, probably they are the weakness, they have less days of pregnancy. No, we didn't use any premature calves. Everything premature was taken out. Only calves that you would say these calves did not have a problem with the gestation time, with having a twin, with being ET or anything, just kind of like the prime of the prime. And we still showed that we have a quite uh, big um, prevalence. Thank you. I don't know if anybody has any more questions. If nobody has any more questions for Miriam, we'll leave it there today. Um, thank you so much, Miriam. That was a really interesting presentation. Look forward to seeing the rest of your data. Me too. <laughs> All right. Thanks very much, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.